I'm Jeff Holstein. In this package, there are five slides that are also handouts. Three will contain information that you will want to memorize if you take this seriously. I want to shout out a big thanks to Andrea Atron, FDOT Zone 2 Safety Coordinator. Uh, without Andrea's support and coordination, I would never have developed this to the extent that you will see. I also want to thank Karen Favorite, who really jazzed up the presentation. She's passing out stuff now. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. I've got a question. You can raise your hand on this. How many of you think you can and should change your driving habits to drive safer? Hands, anybody? How many what? Of you can't think you can and should change your driving habits to drive safer? Any hands? You can change them. You can always change them. There's a couple of people here. Okay. Now, you don't have to raise your hand on this. Just smile if it's true. <laughs> How many have younger relatives who have suggested safer driving habits? I guess nobody. That's good. How many of you, and just smile if you know if it's true, how many of you have younger relatives that have suggested safer driving habits? How many have younger relatives who have suggested safer driving habits? Ah, I see one head nodding. Here's my mini bio. Let's see if I can work this right. Okay. I serve on the FDOT uh, District 2 Community Traffic Safety Team. I learned a lot uh, about motorist behavior as a certified traffic cycling instructor in the 2010 through 15 time. A while ago, I uh, entered the age category with the highest death rate of all, except for teenagers, people 70 and above. And of course, there's nobody in that room, in this room like that, right? Okay. I built this primarily around a very versatile and widely used combat decision making tool called OODA. O O D A. And a salute to the late Colonel John 32nd, 42nd Boyd, USAF, for inventing it and spreading it especially to the U.S. Marine Corps. First, we'll cover the real takeaways from this. Then, we'll talk about instant gratification. This is in your packet. So what will be your main takeaway? First, I'll show you how to use your, set your mirrors for part of your blind zones how they can help, and what you'll have to get used to. Then I'll define OODA and how to adapt it to a defensive driving. You'll learn how to use it and maintain safe following distance. Then I'll show you scan patterns that I use to navigate intersections and other potential conflicts. Some could make your eyes glaze over, but if you look at them in the context of OODA, they'll make sense. And if you actually use OODA while driving, you develop your own similar defensive driving habits. Now, I know that no one knows if and when they'll have an avoidable crash, but everyone knows when the auto insurance bill is due, and it's not fun. Most insurance companies have a discount app which tracks your driving and offers discounts. Most will track your cell phone usage and ding you big time for using it. The first three items there under you control. And because you can control your cell phone usage while driving, you just don't do it. It takes self-discipline. And they'll ding you big time if you do use it. Um, USAA tracks it. 
Most will track some form of dangerous driving. And you can't always control that, but you can manage it. USAA tracks harsh braking. You can see it there. And I'm going to teach you how to manage it. You must master OODA and use it every time you drive. Question. Go ahead. Go ahead. I only have one hand, but so I don't answer my phone when I'm ring and when I'm driving because I have one hand. Right. And when I get to my destination, I'll find out who called me and then I'll, I'll call them back. So. Basically, now this man just said he only has one hand for those of you in the back, and so he never answers the phone while he's driving. I have two hands. I never answer the phone while I'm driving, and people know it. So if somebody calls me when I'm driving, with the USAA app, what you can do is pull into a parking lot and stop the car, get out your phone and use it, and it will not ding you. But if you're using that phone, or if it's in your pocket and you stir your pocket around to get out a wallet or something like that, with the USAA app, it's going to ding you for phone handling. And those dings don't go back away nearly as fast as harsh braking. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. What if you have Bluetooth? Doesn't matter. If, if you're hooked up through the car and you hit the button to talk, it's going to ding you for phone calling. It'll call it hands free if the phone's in your pocket. It's unsafe to use your phone while you're driving. Even if it's Bluetooth. Even if it's Bluetooth, because you're concentrating on something other than driving. Driving's a full-time job. Yes, ma'am. So if you just pull over and your car's still running, you still then you you have to turn the car off. No, you don't. You have to pull over and make sure it's stopped. So pull into a parking lot or anything like that. State Farm. I have not had a problem, USAA. State Farm may other, and I can only speak to USAA. State Farm, I'm, I'm hearing, will ding you if the car is not turned off. There are differences between each app, and you have to learn the idiosyncrasies of your app. But at least USAA, and I suspect the others, they give you a four-week training period when you first load the app where at the end of four weeks, no matter what dings you've got on there, they don't count. They're going to reset the app for you, and then it's going to count for score. I can't swear that State Farm does that or anybody else, but that's what USAA does. And that's your learning period. I also can't account for what other uh, insurance companies do, but with USAA, even if you don't change your habits, if you just install the app, you get about a 10, it's either 5 or 10% discount just for having the app on. But if you want to get the 30% discount, you're going to have to use what I'm going to cover here. Ready to move on? First, we're going to talk about setting our side view mirrors. Most people set their side view mirrors for straight back shown on the left. And you can see that they don't hit the blind spot at all. You can set them to partially cover the worst part of your blind spot by leaning your head over near the left window and move the mirror out until you can just see the edge of the car. Then you move your head back over the console, you do the same thing with the right mirror. And what, what you do when you do that, when you're in the driver's seat, you see the view that's on your right there, where you have covered the worst part of your blind zone. But please notice, there's still blind zone there that you're not covering with your mirrors. Now, it's going to be disturbing when you do that at first. Because now in your mirrors, you're going to pick up motion of the roadside and stuff like that that you never see when they're pointed straight aft. Give it a week or so, 
and your mind will adjust and then you, you won't see that stuff anymore. When you're sitting in the driver's position, you're going to see what you see on the left there. And you can see clearly that that Honda is in your blind zone. And so you know that it's unsafe to make a lane change. On your right, if you lean over from the normal driver's position, you can see that whole lane. By the way, these pictures were taken at a double left turn uh, stop. That's why the cars are all bunched together, and that's why I took it there for safety. Okay? But if you lean over towards the window, you can see that whole lane, and if there's an opening, you can see that opening. Now, this really helps, but once again, I need to stress it does not replace the need for a backward glance. Remember I said they can often warn you of danger. They can't always tell you if it's safe. Did you notice that little that end of that other car in the previous slide? The one with the arrow? Maybe you didn't. But that car is forward of your mirror and it is well within the blind zone and that's why it requires a backward glance. It's so important before changing lanes. Now, nobody here has limited neck mobility, right? Nobody here has limited neck mobility, right? I'm going to show you a quick exercise. You take and you look, look all the way around as far back as you can see. And you can't see my eyes, but I can see where the wall stops back there in my peripheral vision. And my normal vision is right in my blind zone. Then I go the other way. I do the same thing. And I can see the edge of the, uh, the bulletin board there with my peripheral vision and my normal vision is looking right there. If you do that exercise, say, 10, 20 times a day, every day, you can do it sitting down if you can't stand. What the important thing is, is you want to work your neck to be able to do that mobility. And if you do that, it'll make it much safer when you have to change lanes. Questions? This is the UDA loop, and this is in your packet. UDA is an acronym for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. When you do it again and again, it's a loop. It's a constant decision loop. Defensive driving is much about knowing and managing space around your vehicle. The most controllable space you have is your following distance. Yet in my observation, only about one in four Florida drivers actually use, say, following distance. Put yourself in that, in that van for a moment. Where you see the red exclamation points, that's traffic around you. You can't control it, but you ca have to know that it's there. It's important for changing lanes. It's important for know how far back somebody is when you have to stop. All those reasons. Where you see the green check mark, that's your following distance. And you can absolutely control that. So how is it that a military decision-making tool can help in defensive driving? In combat and police work, it's used to throw the bad guy off balance and keep them reactive. In defensive driving, it's almost the opposite. Your normal decisions and actions will cause you to operate your vehicle smoothly and predictably. But you'll have much greater awareness of what's ahead and around you. 
You'll recognize those who could potentially create a threat either by inattention, distraction, or mistake. And you'll already have a plan to deal with it. Here's how to use OODA. Memorize the acronym and its steps. O O D A. Now, I'm going to repeat those slowly, and after each one, I want you to tell me what it stands for. For O. Observe. O. Orient. D. Decide. A. Act. Great, you did it. You've got to use it consciously while driving to develop safe following distance and scan patterns to protect you from all kinds of threats. Until now, we've only talked about OODA in observing and orienting. In the next slides, we'll also talk about deciding and acting. If you do all of this over time, OODA will fade mostly to the background, but your new habits will become automatic. For safe following distance, the Florida Driver's Handbook specifies four seconds minimum, more for night, inclement weather, or slowing of reflexes due to aging. This is a visual example of using a prominent landmark, which you pretty much have to do above 50 miles an hour. Below 50, I often pick a specific dashed line in the lane divider, but many things can work. In this example, when the vehicle ahead passes the pole, start counting. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi. If the pole hasn't passed you by then, you're good. Otherwise, back out. Why is this so important? This is new. I just found this the other day. And this slide is in your package. It used to be you could accelerate and coast with the accelerator, but as soon as you hit the brake pedal, the brake lights would come on. That's how all of your cars work, right? With electric vehicles, you may not have to touch the brake pedal. They can use what's called regenerative braking, where easing on the accelerator causes braking force that's turned into electricity that goes back into the battery and it's settable for various degrees of aggressiveness. And at the point at which the brake lights come on during this so-called one-pedal driving varies widely. The three most offending brands are expecting to have fixes this summer. However, other brands have the problem to various degrees. Experts pretty much agree that 0.12 g deceleration force equals light, light braking. That's about 12% of the force of gravity and where the brake lights should come on. However, there is no federal deceleration force standard for brake lights and it will likely be a while before there is. This slide tells you how to find the full 17 page consumer report article and I would strongly suggest that you read it. When you're following too close, you have one mission. Don't crash into the vehicle immediately in front of you. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, right? It takes your full attention. At safe following distance, you can take in the whole roadway ahead. Traffic lights, brake lights, congestion, the full Monty. And if the vehicle ahead brakes harshly, you have extra distance to brake more normally. I went to four seconds before the Florida Driver's License Handbook did in 2022. I did it to placate my USAA app. 
This is in your packet. As soon as I give you the slide, that one right there. Measured in time, safe following distance is easy. Measured in distance is constantly changing. Speed limits change. Vehicles slow and stop for intersections and congestion. They bunts up, then they speed up, and you must accelerate slower than the vehicle ahead in order to open safe following distance as speed increases. Counting Mississippi to keep safe following distance is almost like combat. A good defensive driver will count Mississippi's a lot. Now, I know what's in your head, in your minds right now. Hazard a guess? Raise your hand, anybody. Take a guess. Nobody wants to guess? Okay. How the heck do you do that? Whoops. How the heck do you do that? That's the question. With that kind of gap, people cut right in front of you, right? Everybody agrees? What are some other reasons you can't do it? Any hands? Okay. Actually, it's pretty simple. It requires some discipline. Who can tell me how you would do it? Okay. Here comes the answer. Wait for it. Obey the speed limit. Everybody's giggling. Instead of flowing with traffic, I started obeying the speed limit three years ago. So over half the drivers around me are going five plus miles an hour faster than me. I've never had a driver badger me by another driver because I was following the speed limit. Yes, cars pass me all the time. Some whip around and pull back in right in front of me. No worry, two to three seconds later, they'll be out to say following distance and beyond without me having to do anything at all. It's actually made, made driving less stressful. What's an intersection? Can you read this in the back? Okay, then I won't read it to you. But intersections are everywhere. This is a list that covers most. I'll give you a moment. And what do they produce? Threats to your right-of-way. For the fix, next few minutes, we'll talk about people who could crash into you when you have the right-of-way. The top three are probably the most important common things that drivers look at. Of course, with turn signals, many Floridians couldn't be bothered. <laughs> so is there anything else that you could look at? Hands, anybody? Where's the hand? Okay. Okay, so if you're wanting to go into the middle lane, you have to see if the third lane person is interested in coming over when you are. You know? Well, that's true. Well, that's what I was thinking. Um, that is true. I was talking mostly about intersections, but you bring up a point that I hadn't thought of. Um, here's what you can do, though, at intersections. A vehicle's front wheels can tell a lot, and much sooner than just observing the vehicle's overall motion. I learned this as a traffic cycling instructor. It works just as well when you're driving a motor vehicle. Observing is always the first step of OODA. As a vehicle slows to a stop, the wheels spin down to where they stop rotating. Here's a vehicle that's fully stopped. The wheels aren't rotating. If they start to rotate close to your right-of-way, that could be trouble, and you have to act 
quickly. It's also important if you're in a roundabout to watch the wheels of vehicles approaching the yield signs to make sure that they will yield. A vehicle's front wheels can also tell you a lot about where the car that's turning will end up. For example, if you're in the left through lane and a vehicle pulls out close to you, if you see where the wheels are pointed, that's where the car will go. In this case here, the right lane. In other cases, if you're in the right through lane, the vehicle may pull out into the left through lane or go to the center median or horrors into your lane requiring an evasive action, likely braking. At least you're prepared. This is a summary chart and it's in your handout package uh, and it's important. This is an unconventional intersection. At left, I'm not terribly concerned about the car waiting to turn left because I've observed the driver sitting there looking at oncoming traffic. Also, his front wheels aren't turned hard left, so he's likely not preparing for a U-turn, but I'll keep an eye on him. At right, the stopped truck presents a bigger problem because I don't know where that driver is looking. For the truck, I need a plan. Remember how we set the mirrors? Time permitting, I'll glance at the left side mirror and left outside to see if an emergency lane change is an option. I almost always hover my foot over the brake and ready with the horn and consider emergency turn options. At situational OODA in action, observe the truck, evaluate your situation, decide and if necessary, act to prevent or mitigate a crash. Approaching an intersection, it's always important to observe and orient. What's the general traffic flow? How busy? What kind of traffic? Motor vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists? What are the traffic controls? Lights, stop signs, etc. That provides basic orientation to the intersection before you get there. In the next few slides, you'll see a lot of arrows. They're my scan patterns. Don't be cowed by them. Rather, with OODA in mind, observe, orient, decide, act. Envision the scan pattern and what to look for and what decisions and actions you might be prepared to take. Using OODA on the road, you'll develop your own similar scan patterns. At the stopping bar, I stop. I actually do stop. I first check for pedestrians and cyclists. Those are the red arrows. Now, in today's age, there are a lot of electrified mobility devices. They range from electric assist bicycles to electrified scooters and more and they come up on the intersections much, much faster. And unfortunately, many of these riders treat traffic control devices, especially stop signs, as suggestions. <laughs> Hence, the yellow arrows. I look away from the intersection to safely clear it, both sides. If I'm in a community that allows golf carts and other micro mobility devices. Extra longer range vigilance is needed there as well. well. Continuing my scan towards the left. This is harder to read than it actually is for me to do in the car. It's automatic in the car. I check for cross traffic and whether they have a stop sign. 
Note the red circle for pedestrians and left turning vehicles. And farther from the intersection for electrified bikes, etc. Remember, cyclists can and do ride opposing traffic on sidewalks. Many also ride illegally opposing traffic in the roadway. If in the roadway, they may be in the wrong, or in fact they are in the wrong, but they'll fare much worse in a collision. And legally or illegally, they're often coming from a direction that the driver isn't expecting. We all, all expect threats fr from the left, right? Cyclists may be coming from the right, especially on the sidewalk. Finally, I repeat for the left side. In some cases, I have to pull forward of the stopping bar to do this. If I'm going straight or turning left, I have to check gaps both ways. The approaching cars in this image, car does have a stop sign circled in red. I make sure the driver isn't going to run it. Before moving into the crosswalk, I double check right again for pedestrians and cyclists. I can't stress enough the importance of that glance in the opposite direction just before going. This is a recap of what we just talked about. If I'm watching for a gap in traffic no matter which direction, just before it arrives, I again do a quick opposite direction check to see if anything has changed. That's step eight up there in blue. Again, I can't stress the importance of that opposite check. Because I do it regularly, I once avoided hitting three teenagers who had entered the crosswalk in front of my car. By the way, if you can't do all of this, by the way, you can't do all of this if you don't come to a full stop. We've all used that right on red with the yield sign. Arrow one looking right and forward are the probably obvious. Arrow two looking left to the cross street is my first assessment of left to right crossing traffic. I'll do it again just before completing my turn. In a complex intersection like this, there's likely a dedicated left turn directly opposite me on the cross street. If so, when those cars start turning left, they will protect me from left to right through traffic. One big note of caution, somebody may be making a U-turn there. The giveaway is that the front wheels will turn sharply as they enter the intersection. I observe and am, be, am prepared for dealing with this. The right to left scan is similar, but I also need to check for left turning traffic across my lane arrow too. If there's a dedicated left turn across the intersection, it's likely those cars will get a green arrow while I'm still yielding. Before I complete the turn, I make sure they haven't started moving. Arrow three is where I often must move to check the left cross traffic before turning right on yield. Finally, that gray truck in the red circle in the dedicated left turn lane ahead, is he going to turn left or is he going to turn U-turn when he gets the green arrow? I keep an eye on him as I complete my turn. And if I'm in that truck, I'm watching for conflicting traffic of turning traffic as I make the U-turn. When passing through an intersection with a green light, trust but verify. Remember I made an assessment of what's happening at the intersection well before the light I got before I got to it. That includes the traffic light. If you look at the green circled numbers from one to six, this is a scan that I do as my car moves through the intersection. First, pedestrians and cyclist traffic right, then left, then left to right across traffic, then 
opposing left turn traffic, then right to left crossing traffic, finally right turn traffic on the red drivers. Can you all see those blue or those green numbers? Okay. About the green light, the Florida Driver's Handbook states, approach at a speed that will allow you to slow down if the light changes. Probably should say and stop, because that's what you're supposed to do. That's another reason to obey the speed limit. Traffic yellow light times are generally set to allow a safe stop from the posted speed limit without entering the intersection, not five plus miles per hour above it. In my view, the most dangerous time to enter an intersection is right after the green light, red light, the light turns green. Show of hands, anybody got an idea of the safest way to enter it? Anybody? Go ahead. Uh, at least three or five seconds after the light changes. Okay. You're saying three to five seconds. Others say one to two seconds. But a lot of people will say you need to delay. Right. If the light sight lines are clear, and if, and this is a big if, if you develop a scan pattern that can safely clear the intersection, you might not need to wait. And, and I'll say again, if you haven't developed that scan pattern and you do wait for the light, however many seconds you wait, by all means, don't change. I have a six-step pattern that I use again and only if the sight lines are clear. I've already checked right for cyclists and pedestrians which are waiting for the light to turn. As I release the brakes, I check again, circle one, and then reverse left circle two through four for pedestrians, cyclists, left to right traffic, red runners, road run, uh, light runners, left to right road light runners. You know what I'm talking about and left turning, opposing traffic. As I accelerate, I switch to the right to check for right to left red light runners and then right on red turners. I have that process completed before I get a third of the way into the intersection. You don't have to give away your thoughts to anybody else. Just smile at me if you thought that using OODA made those scan patterns more sensible. I see a few smiles out here. That's good. There are three slides that you must uh, memorize. This slide, the one on front wheels, and the one about measuring safe following distance. They're in your package. Memorize them and use them consciously. Do that and you'll develop your own scans. As time goes on, the scans will become natural and OODA will slip into your subconscious. You can bring it back anytime you need to. With OODA as your decision tool, you'll be a much safer driver. Last, this is a list of generally recognized benefits from exercise. Most of these aren't required to safely drive a car, except that last one, cognitive function. And that's an absolute necessity. But those other benefits have a great deal to do with your quality of life. The age range that an elderly person normally decides to stop driving is usually north of 70 and can often go into the 80s and 90s. So do you want to drive longer than the average bear? Use OODA and exercise regularly, consistent with your strength and mobility. Now, I know many of you are living in a retirement center over here. Do you have a gym there? No matter what you can do, I will tell you, a year and a half ago, I had serious, serious balance problems. I should have been on a cane. I fell three times before I went through rehab, but I learned 
and I exercise regularly. And that training that I did at Brooks and the training that your instructor may have you do will be the hardest thing you've done in decades. But it will pay big time in mobility. That wasn't in my prepared notes, but that's how it goes. And I'll mention one other thing. Shortly after I completed Brooks, my wife passed away unexpectedly after a short uh, terminal illness. And I had a choice to stay in the house that we built with all of our memories or go to a nursing home or an old assisted living home. And it wasn't a choice for me. The choice was how was I going to stay in that home? And I'm there now and I'm there because I work hard on my mobility. And I'm suggesting to you, it's not too late to work on mobility if you've got an instructor and a place to work out. Anything you can do will help you. That concludes my prepared remarks. Yes, sir. Uh, 